Hi everybody, wherever you may be. My name is Larry. My call sign is Kilo Seven Hotel November. I'd like to welcome you to a very special edition of Ham Radio Live. This is technically show number ninety-two, but it's more than that. This is so special. It's live in four K with Martin F. Jew, the originator, the owner of MFJ, who's still here, still in the building in Starkville, and we're honored. We're just beyond words honored to be here. If you have questions about maybe their history, maybe about products, maybe about Mr. Jew and how he started this incredible, just, it's the largest ham radio supplier, builder, manufacturer in the world today. How we all did this is just miraculous. I'd like to introduce everybody right now to Mr. Martin F. Jew of MFJ. There he is right there, live on your cameras. Hello, Mr. Jew. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Hello to everybody. Be here with Larry. Um, thank you. Um, would you tell us a little bit about what the road's been like for you? You know, I think one of the things you said in our first interview that I loved what you said was your greatest accomplishment. You said was I've never had to let anyone off the hook. I've never had to let anyone off. It told me who you were as a man. It told me an awful lot. So I'm gonna flip it on you. I'm going to ask you, what do you think one of your biggest failures has been? Um, this is well, a tough question. Well, I have had so many failures. Where would you like for me to start? <laughs> <laughs> what, what part of life? What area of life? You know, I would say any part of your life. Because I, I believe we learn the most from our failures. We always grow the most from our failures. And what I love about you is you're so humble your greatest accomplishment was an ultimate son of a goal. So I started thinking about it. You must have had some failures in life where you really grew from them. Could you tell us a story about maybe one of those failures that really helped you? Well, I'm not sure if I would call it a failure, but it, what I wish I had done differently. Can I answer it that way? Sure. I wish that I had spent lots more time with my little daughter when she was growing up. I spent so much time working and uh, just trying to build something that uh, that's that's the biggest thing that I regret. But I'm trying to make up for all that now. Oh, how that's, that's wonderful. So yeah, I spent a lot of we spent a lot of time with uh, our two little grand kids we have a three and a half year old grandson and and a six year old uh, granddaughter and um, we spend as much time we FaceTime almost every day you're very good we're live with Martin F. Jew the originator of MFJ if you have questions please put them on the screen I understand we've got low volume low volume and I do my best to bring it up for you folks, but keep in mind, Mr. Jew is a Southern gentleman, and he speaks low. It's okay. So we're going to do this. I'm going to bring the camera a little closer to him to increase the microphone gain for you all, and then we're going to make sure that we can let you see him real good, but I also want you to hear him real good. So we're going to make this a little better for you guys. He's a Southern gentleman. He speaks softly. I think it's one of the coolest parts about it. So if you have an MFJ question, you have a question about their history, I'm going to write that up, whatever it might be, I think you're fine. Okay. It's just fine. If you have a question about MFJ, maybe their history, maybe their product, he'll tell you. He knows. He knows. What do you think the greatest advancement has been for ham radio in your lifetime? What's the biggest advancement you've seen? Well, it, you know, ham radio has changed by an incredible amount. When I first got into ham radio, um, I was in high school, before high school, but I got my ham radio license when I was 16 years old. And the two big things that we did was either uh, CW or single sideband. And... I don't know if you can see it, but around my office on the shelves are my collection of uh, radio transmitters and receivers back 
from the 1950s, 1960s. <laughs> yes, yeah. indeed. But back then, we either talked on single side band, uh, uh, which was just getting started, or on AM, or we used Morse code. But now, the hobby has ham radio now as it was in the past is a uh, very social hobby it's about people getting together and interacting with each other um, that's the basis of ham radio it, it is it's known as the original social media <laughs> the original social media wow so you were on your way to a doctorate you were working on your doctor, you were going to go to Mississippi State, and you ended up in a hotel room for 50 cents a day, starting to build kits, and it all took off from there. Could you talk more about all of that and how that okay. all began? Yeah. Well, um, I had, um, I, I left from Hollandale, Mississippi, where I grew up, and I was born in Vicksburg, Mississippi. But I came up here to Starkville, to Mississippi State University, to get an electrical engineering degree. And then I went to Georgia Tech to get a master's degree in electrical engineering. And then I went back home and ran the family grocery store for a little while. And then I took a job, worked for about a year. And one evening, I got a call from a professor at Mississippi State asking me if I wanted to come back um, to Mississippi State University to work on a Ph.D. degree. Well, I really didn't want to work on a Ph.D. degree. I just wanted to come back home. So I came back home and I finished the, all the coursework in the first three semesters. And But during that time, I had always wanted to start some kind of a business because that's how I grew up. I grew up in a little grocery store, and back in those days, everybody was in some kind of a business. I mean, we didn't have corporate jobs like we have today. They were like shoemakers or a bricklayer or electrician. They were just doing their own thing, and that's what I thought everybody did, and that's what I wanted to do. So I needed something to build and not or, or do. And the first thing I did was to start an engineering design company to design um, uh, electronic circuits for the various research departments at Mississippi State. And, uh, and after a few projects, I found out pretty quick that all I could do was all I could do. I just couldn't get very big very fast so I decided to build some products and have some other people build them so um, and because I had been a ham radio for a long time that's what I wanted to build so I, I built um, some kits uh, CW filter kit single sideband filter kit uh, while I was still uh, teaching courses and uh, working on research project at Mississippi State. But I rented a downtown hotel room, broken down hotel room for 50 cents a day and started etching PC boards uh, 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 in a Pyrex uh, bow that was on top of a, uh, um, a heater, one, one of those electric heaters. Uh, using ferric chloride, etching the boards and and with a hand drill mounted on a stand, drilling the holes in the board and building the boards and soldering the boards and and uh, taking the order, shipping it out. I was doing everything. But um, uh, <coughs> the... Uh, How long did you do that for? 
Well, I did that for about three months in the hotel room until the manager came to the hotel room because I was stinking up the place and uh, making too much noise. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. And then you you started building. Where did you go from there? You went to the hotel room? Well, I found a place close to campus. It was in a building uh, that a six screen printer he was just kind of fooling around full of junk and he was uh renting the back section it was only about six foot wide and and about the length of the building not the length but the width of the building and about six foot for space it must have been 30 or 40 feet something like that and and uh um we um, started making stuff there, and it wasn't long before he was charging us more rent than he himself was paying rent for the whole building. So we left there, and I think we moved to a trailer, a little 50-foot trailer. And... Um, we built all the products in that trailer, and I hired some of my students. And one of my students, who had a career as a Continental Airline pilot, came to visit me, and he told me the main thing that he remembered was the refrigerator that was always full of Coca Cola. <laughs> That's all I ever drank was just Coca Colas. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's one, great. one of the other things I remember about that trailer was uh, we were using these um, uh, little boxes, little aluminum cabinets we got from Radio Shack. And we bought them all, all from the whole country. And so we had, I had to find someone to take some aluminum sheets and bend them up so we could make our own uh, cabinets. And I bought this spray paint machine from Sears and Roebuck. And we stood outside of the trailer and spray painted those aluminum boxes wearing these old World War II gas masks. And then after a while, all the cars parked around us. They started looking like the color of our cabinets. <laughs> we'll ride with, with uh, Martin, Martin F. Q. Oh, oh, this is from, from MFJ. MFJ. What's, What's your favorite, favorite product? product? What, what, you, what do you love? love? What's your heart in that you guys sell? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> this has been about 25 years ago when I was in my office on a Sunday afternoon trying to figure out how to measure RF resistance without having to balance a bridge. And I was trying to do it so I could just read the RF resistance on a meter. And all of a sudden it dawned on me, well, instead of doing that, why don't I just read SWR? And that was the birth of the antenna analyzer. And that was the first antenna analyzer in the world. That's what started it all. Now, of course, everybody makes them and they're much more sophisticated. But that was uh, really my favorite product. This was a, a product that you could hold in your hand and uh, test your antennas and measure various pr- parameters of it. Back in the early days of ham radio, <clears throat> you had no idea what your SWR was. And you would basically tune your transmitter, which had a Pi network in it, uh, by going through a process loading and dipping until you could get power in back when I was a young ham I had no idea what the SWR was uh, and if you did have an SWR meter you had to take a transmitter out there supply power to it with an SWR meter and this product um, <clears throat> which there's probably more of the MFJ 259-269 antenna analyzers in the world by far than any other analyzers because we sold them for so long. And they we still sell them because the, they're much better, much different than they 
were in the past, but that's by far my favorite product. My second favorite has been our line of antenna tuners. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I'm just going to move positions here closer to the mic. Okay. So you have a lot of antenna tuners. You were talking about that. What do you think the antenna tuner that that you would like to see, or or help maybe you have, young ham starting out, getting a new tuner? What would you advise for the first time or younger ham to start out with? Well. You know, ham radio is a learning hobby. And I would like to see a ham <clears throat> understand what he's doing. And it's much uh, <clears throat> much more intuitive to understand uh, how antennas work by using a manual antenna tuner instead of an automatic tuner where you push a button or you're talking to your radio and all you know is you have a low SWR. Uh, but if you use a manual tuner, you can get a feel for what's going on. Uh, I love my, my old 969. 969. I love my 969. So, so you know it pretty well. well. If you were you starting, starting out as a ham today in 2020, brand new, new what, what kind of items would you recommend for a ham radio operator, operator to start out, out with today, with Mr. Jew? <laughs> okay, well, there's various uh, areas that our young folks are interested in. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> that, you know, it's really a hard question because I'm more biased toward communicating through Morse code. I, I mean, I would say a, a low power Morse code transmitter, a simple antenna, and a simple receiver, um, it's harder to get into ham radio so familiar with computer, uh, I would say maybe one of the digital programs, digital modes, like FT8 would make it really easy, and they can have fun making contacts all over the world. There's so many different digital modes that they can operate uh, in different forms. Uh, I would say one of those two modes, uh, Morse code or some digital modes, Okay. okay, that's, that's fantastic. fantastic. Is there something, something that you really are excited, excited about, about right, right now that MFJ is making? making? You know, you know something, something that just really, really you look at, at and you say, wow, wow that's, that's pretty, pretty cool. cool. Um, well, you know, we have uh, our starting, not starting, but we're extending. One of the biggest problems our hams are having now uh, is the ability to put antennas up. Um, so we're developing antennas that will allow someone with no space to put antenna. We're bringing out a new uh, very high efficiency box fan loop. Um, it's about three foot by three foot, but it'll perform almost as efficiently as a full-size antenna that you can carry around and uh, use it almost anywhere. Um, that's, that's probably one of our most exciting products. I know there's a lot of loops that's being made now, but uh, the... Uh, thing about loops is if you don't build it right, the efficiency is super low. Uh, let me just give you an example. On 20 meters, if you take uh, a loop antenna that's made of a, a aluminum tubing that's one inch in diameter but 30 inches in overall loop size, the radiation resistance of, of that 20 meter loop, it's only about 50 milliohms. That's milliohms. Well, the DC resistance just of that conductor is 50 milliohms. 
So that means you lose half your power uh, with no contacts of any kind. And that's the reason we every connection we make is welded. There are no rotating contacts of any kind, no mechanical contacts. Even the variable capacitor has no rotating contacts because we use a butterfly capacitor uh, to tune it. But if you use uh, uh, a loop that has screw-on connectors and made of something like braid from a piece of coax, oh, that's super lossy. And your efficiency is just incredibly low. Um, Anyway, that's what I'm excited about. This uh, the uh, uh, box fan loop that's made of all welded construction with no uh, no uh, mechanical contacts of any kind. Excellent. Good. Yeah. Good. Well, the uh, the other question I have for you, and, and this I think more ties in with trying to figure out. And again, folks, I understand there's some audio issues, and I, I get it. We're it's a work in progress. First time we've done this. So I appreciate your patience, but we are live with Martin F. Jew, and he is in 4K. And we're grateful that we were able to do that to come here. And thank you very much for the invitation, Mr. Jew. We're, we're honored, truly. We have some questions here, some good questions. Let me get to them here that I'd like to be able to, to ask them. A uh, question from Alex Alonzo. He asks, what would be a good ATU manual tuner? for a first timer your thoughts okay well we have several manual tuners now uh, uh, most of our tuners are T networks and the reason for us selecting a T network is because it has the widest matching range of uh, any tuner circuit for a given set of components um, we have various models I think one of our most popular one is the MFJ949, which is a complete antenna tuner console that includes not just the tuner, but the SWR meter. It includes a dummy load and an antenna switch. So in one box, you have most of the accessories that you need for your ham radio station. Now, if you need just a basic tuner, uh, I would suggest the MFJ902, and that's just a basic tuner, and it'll easily handle 150 watt any transceiver, And but you need to use a uh, SWR meter, one that's built into your radio works fine, and that's a very nice tuner, and it's only about four inches by two and a half inches by two inches. All air variable capacitor and it's tuned from 10 meters through 80 meters. All right, excellent. We've got uh, Gunter joining us from uh, Wiesbaden, Germany. Gunter, thank you for coming. We appreciate it. Alexander in the UK, we're grateful you're here as well. Hello to uh, Ron in Florida, sorry, in, in, uh, in Canada, the uh, province of Ontario, Victor Alpha 3. Foxtrot Union Charlie, Allen's here, Alpha Bravo 8, Alpha Sierra. If you have any questions for Mr. Martin F. Jew from MFJ, just a few more minutes here live with him to ask your questions. We would love to be able to ask them. Question from the UK from Alexander. He said, I'd be interested in a small scale, high efficiency antenna for HF 40 through 6. Can you think of anything that might be available for him? Small scale. He's working in a community that has some HOA issues. Okay. Um, I would uh, recommend either the box fan loop or our 1788 or 1786. Those are circular loops that will easily fit in a room or in your attic or in a, in a garden or on the back deck on your uh, backyard. And... It'll cover, one model will cover 40 through, um, I think, 15 meters. The other one, uh, 30 meters through 10 meters. Uh, six meters is really not much of a problem. You can do that with a four and a half foot vertical or, or a short dipole that you can string uh, inside. Um, but I think you... Uh, we'll get the most versatility by using a loop. 
if you use a wire antenna for 40 meters, you need uh, about 66, 67 foot for a dipole antenna. But you can run a random wire with an antenna tuner in the ground and load up oh, probably 16, 20 feet and be able to operate those bands. Um, uh, that would be the easiest thing to try. Take a, a manual antenna tuner uh, with some wire and a counterpause wire about the same length um, and just random wire tune it. Uh, an automatic tuner may not be able to tune that wide range. That's fantastic. We thank you for that. A lot of a lot of folks here today. Alpha Echo One Tanga Papa slash Alpha Nine Two Germany Whiskey. Tom, hi from Bahrain. MFJ is a unique company. Sooner or later, every ham will own something from MFJ. Seventy three gents. He's right. Tom, you're right. MFJ is the largest ham radio manufacturer in the world. It's that there's not even anything close. So you've got not only MFJ, you have High Gain, you have Cushcraft, you have Ameritron, you have Vectronics. Um, the list just goes on and on with, with MFJ. And you've slowly built this company up as time has went by. I mean, I've got here Delta Kilo 5 Oscar November Victor in Germany saying, still has his Vectronics HFT 1500. Um, some great comments here. Colorado. Scott, hello there, the smoking ape. He says, hello from Earth. The MFJ crew is great. <laughs> Alexander from Great Britain says, I was looking for a 1788 Atlanta. So he's looking at the loop, the 1788 loop antenna for himself. How is the transmit on such an antenna in terms of dB compared to a dipole, for example? Okay, well, the radiation pattern... Uh, the loop is very similar to a dipole. The difference is in the efficiency of it. On a higher band, the loop is, is almost as efficient as a dipole. Now, on the lower band, like on 40 meters, it's pretty good bit lower efficiency than a dipole, but still you're able to make plenty of contacts. You know, a dipole efficiency is about 98, 99%. What that means is, if um, if you take a 100 watt transmitter, uh, 98 watts is being transmitted out. Now, even if you have a loop that's only say 50% efficient, what that means is uh, instead of putting a full 100 watts out, you're putting 50 watts out. Now, uh, if you have an efficiency of 50% and uh, you're only putting half the power out in to space, that um, uh, on the receiving end, end, they probably can't hear the difference. It takes about 6 dB of difference, four times the power, for one S unit change. So half the power uh, on the receiving end, you probably can't even hear any difference. Very good. We're live with Martin F. Jew for a few more moments here. Live from MFJ, Starkville, Mississippi. A guy, a Mississippi lad who came home, stayed home, and built his empire at home. His, uh, I, I, I'm still struck by one of the points he made in our last time we met. And I mean this. And I, I told you this before we did the show. I think the thing that always stuck with me about you was you saying your greatest accomplishment in life was to have not laid a person off in your history of here. That told me everything about you. That just blew me away. I, I, it told me your heart and, and where you're at with that. How, and I'm trying to get to a few more questions here. We do have a few more. We want to welcome the Smoking Ape. Welcome to the show. want to welcome uh, Scott from Colorado. Hello, Indiana. Welcome. Glad to have you here. Let me ask you this first, because it's important to Alexander in the UK. He says he's currently using his iGrew G90, which you guys also sell. It's iGrew G90 that tunes my random wire 40 meter quarter wave. It does okay, but I feel I'm not getting out as well as I can on my limited 10 watts of power. He's got a foundation license in the UK. Any ideas to maybe help him be a little more efficient on his antenna that uh, on that Zygu? Well, 
if you can put a dipole up, that's probably the best simple antenna that you can put up. Just if you can get it up high and clear, that's probably the best advice that I could give you. Height is huge. Height is so important, you guys. And, and you know, it's it's one thing to have an antenna, you know, that's long, long enough. But if it's not high enough, it does make such a difference. It's like I've said before in the show. It's like standing on the ground, looking around the horizon, then standing on like a two-story or three-story building and taking a look at the horizon. Your antenna works the same way. The farther it is up high, the lower the takeoff angle, and the farther down the horizon it's going to go to bounce off the ionosphere. It just works better. Otherwise, you have almost a, an NVIS antenna that works almost straight up. You lose a lot of that skip on HF. So, please, you know, any questions you might have for Mr. Jew, we'll do this uh, for a few minutes. Last call, if you'd like to, uh, please just get a hold of him. Please do so now. And I'm sure he'll be able to answer any questions you have regarding MFJ, High Gain, Cushcraft, Maritron, Vectronics. Wow, you've bought a lot of companies. What? Tell me, what was the first of the companies? That, when did they all come into the MFJ family, Mr. Jew? Well, the first one was a Maritron that we brought from the state of Ohio down here. Uh, when Ameritron was uh, very small with just a few products, and since then we have redesigned all the products, and there are probably more Ameritron amplifiers that's being used in the world than any other amplifier, including the the uh, Heathkit SB220s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, uh, <clears throat> you've got quite a radio collection here. Yeah. You do. Um, I want to show that radio collection real quick. Because, folks, we, we, we can't stay a long time, but we want to show you a good time. And I think this is so impressive. During the last show, we, think we had an opportunity to talk to Mr. Jew and had a great conversation. Just a great conversation with him. About, and I know the volume's a little hot here. Let me turn it down while we got you, okay? Make it a little listenable, not so crazy loud. Here is some of his collection. Now, keep in mind, some of it is, is, is also in another location here, but look at this. They started collecting way back, right? Yeah, yeah. Some of these go back into the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s. There's some pieces of heat kit equipment, uh, Drake equipment, helicrafter equipment, national radio, sideband engineers, uh, Tentec equipment, um, some accessories, a lot of QRP, lots of uh, QRP uh, Tentec equipment, and then some uh, 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 big antenna tuners that uh, go way back to the Millen days. Um, most of these are American uh, radios. You can see the Helicrafter, the mm -hmm. Drake. Yes. And um, there's a Harvey Wells transmitter on the ends, and right to the left of the Harvey Wells, there's two small boxes. Those were the first pieces of tra transistorized ham radio equipment that was made in the world. Those are Regency mobile converters. Regency was the company that brought out the first transistor radio in America. Wow. Wow. And the, and the radios go on. I, I'll tell you, I am a huge shortwave nut. I, I've loved, I've been an SWL person for most of my life. It goes back 48 years. And I just don't want to have a problem here with uh, with my computer. So I'm going to have to thank you, sir. Appreciate that. I think everybody in the room here is so is so impressed with his collection that they're literally just blown away. Because you don't see stuff like this. Helicrafters, Drake, Knight, Regency. They're all here. I mean, and he's got them. And some of these things are just absolutely stunning. Look at this one that's in plastic. Tell me about the one in the plastic here. Looks brand new. Yeah, there's Godset. The Godset in the plastic bag is a AM transmitter and receiver in a box before the days of transceivers. There's Atlas Radio over there. There's also a Carnar, which was a kit. It was a course that was 
So back in the 60s, there's a transmitter and a receiver, and um, <sighs> there's um, uh, I think that's a Lafayette. Yep, look at that right there. Okay. Look at that Lafayette. Yeah. That's beautiful. And then if you look down a little bit, there's an early pre uh, Helicraft echo phone. Look at this, folks. I'm gonna move this. Is it okay if I move this just yeah. a little bit? Yeah. I don't want to hurt anything. Look at this. This looks like it's 50s, early, uh, mid 50s. 50s or 40s. That's that was pre Helicraft. Helicraft bought Echo Phone and, and uh, turned it into their um, S38 series. And Beautiful. To the right of that is a National NC60. Look at that. That's the earliest shortwave receiver. Oh, these are vacuum tubes. Look at this, real quick, folks. Look at that. And, and what's beautiful about it is it's it's got the plastic knob still in place. If many people are, are familiar with this radio, one of the things you find on the used ones, which they're all used now, obviously this is an old unit, but this piece right here, it's plastic. A lot of times you find those plastic roll, those plastic knobs eaten or cracked or broken. This is beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. What what are some of your favorites here on the wall? This is amazing. Space spanner. Okay, just a second. We'll get a, get a look at that. We'll do that. That's the night kit. Which Space one? Space spanner. The, this one right here. Okay. That's a shortwave radio, but it's a regenerative shortwave radio, and that was my first receiver. Really? I have the original one. It's on a different shelf. This is one that I bought off of eBay, but that's the one that I first tried to make contacts with. Okay, so which one is that, that you're talking about, your first one? Uh, that one right there. The one at the bottom? The, the so, gray one, yeah, on the second, on the shelf. Very good. Uh -huh. Wow, okay, so the night space spanner. Spanner. Yeah. That was your first radio. Yeah. Three tube ACDC regenerative receiver. Wow. We have some questions here for you. At least, at least I can see one here, and I want to make sure we get to it, because this is such an honor to meet you, and I mean that. I mean Thank you. That. Thank you, my friend. I do mean that. I'll put this right here, okay, so we can make a view of you. We'll put it right back down there, a little bit of an angle of the man who started it all at MFJS, Martin FQ. What a joy. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you some of these comments I do want to get to Ron's he's got a good comment this is from Victor Alpha 3 Foxtrot Union Charlie his question is does MFJ make an antenna great for apartment dwellings for HF uh, we have a whole line of apartment antennas we have some antennas that uh, you can mount on the balcony or, or from a window and it would extend out uh, some of them have uh, artificial ground on it. Uh, we have a whole line of apartment antennas. Um, uh, but if you can uh, just look through our website, uh, things like the 1621s uh, that can be uh, used. I can't remember the model numbers now, but there's several uh, antennas that are designed specifically for apartments. Uh, yep. We have antennas that you can telescope back in and just use them when you want to. What about the Big Ears antenna? I think it's a wonderful product. Uh, the Big Ear is uh, is pretty incredible antenna. I mean, it's well, we have two versions. We have a a uh, kind of a V dipole uh, uh, version and a vertical version. Um, the both versions have 17 foot elements one of them is a dipole version that has a loading coil that allows you to operate all the way down to um, 40 meters well both of them do and uh, uh, one the vertical antenna you can uh, just put a stake in the ground and mount it and uh, just throw out a, a single counterpause antenna and in fact, <clears throat> at home, what I'm using now, because I like to play with uh, uh, indoor antennas, I have uh, one of our 17-foot uh, telescoping antenna with a loading car 
that and a piece of wire on the floor that I used to operate 40 meters and I can make contacts just about any time that I want to. And then a smaller antenna that's probably about six foot tall that's mounted with a loading coil um, on the floor extended up to the ceiling with a catapult wire that I use to operate 20 and 40 meters. In fact, we have a manual screwdriver that you can adjust that antenna to any band that you want to operate on. And uh, this past weekend, I was playing around with that antenna on FT8 and made contacts using 100 milliwatts. (laughs) Wow. That's fantastic. We have some comments here. Alexander from UK, thank you very much for your time and advice. Alex says, man alive, look at those radios. Uh, we've got someone from Indiana, 314, says, loop antennas are good for small spaces. They sure are. And, you know, I think that uh, one of the things I've been impressed with, Mr. Jew, has been how hard your people work here and how sincerely, I guess the word is sincerely dedicated they are to making the products as just perfect as they can. No one can be perfect and make things perfectly, everything perfect, because we're human. But one thing MFJ is very well known for is your customer service. You have excellent people to help answer questions, or if there's a problem with something. How important in that chain do you believe customer service is for people, especially during the coronavirus? Well, customer service is what it's all about. And and, you know, one of the basis of how we started was uh, when I was growing up, uh, we used to have a huge company called Sears and Roebuck. That, they're still around, and but we try to emulate what they uh, try to do, which was very good customer service and good products at affordable prices. Um, the good. Uh, better and best concept. Uh, uh, we took that from the Sears and Roebuck catalog. <laughs> Very good. And and people, you know, I, I you know one of the questions, and we're going to ask it because, you know, I, I think it's important to ask all the questions. And it just came from the state of Pennsylvania last night or the night before. He asked about quality. He said MFJ had no quality control issues in places, and I believe. Any company has that problem because you're making a product. How important is it to you? Someone buys a product. It maybe it's got a cold cold solder joint, or maybe it's missing a component. Something got messed up. It happens. It's a mistake. How committed is MFJ to fixing it, and making it right for the customer? Okay, <clears throat> from the very beginning, <clears throat> we had we have what we call a no matter what guarantee for an entire year what that means is no matter what happens to it for an entire year we'll either fix your product or give you another one and what that means is if you just bought the product and you're driving home with it and it fell out the back of your car and somebody ran over it we'll fix it or give you another one for for a year no matter what We'll take care of you. Who does stuff like that? That's amazing. And that's been since the very start? From the very beginning. Yeah. Folks, that's all you need to know. That's in my opinion. I, I've had MFJ products for many years. And I have not had problems. I've had good time. In fact, you know, I, I did have a problem. I think it was one tuner. And I called. I got immediate help. And it was taken care of. It's, it's just the way it goes. Um, question from Alex. And we'll close off the show from the UK. If someone were to buy a second-hand product, how would they be looked after with such a company policy relating to a product? So I guess what he's talking about is, let's say, for example, someone buys a 998 auto tuner from somebody on QRZ, swap me. And they got it, they've had it for, let's say they had it for seven or eight months, whatever, but they're not the first owner. How would MFJ treat them? I think that's what his question is. Okay, well... We still fix products from our early days, uh, but of course we can't 
uh, fix them for free, we have to charge a fee for fixing it. But um, we've got products that's been out there 20, 30 years that we still fix. Yeah. And keep in mind, folks, is that I think it's important. If you're going to buy it secondhand, you're buying it at a cheaper price than you're paying for it new. Paying for it new gives you that warranty, which does have value. So that's something to keep in mind. No radio manufacturer is going to honor transfer of radio or parts to another person, and then if it breaks, guarantee it. It's just too hard to do it. Things can, too many things can happen. It's a big risk. So we'll close the show out here. Mr. G, we've been with you for 45 minutes, and it's been truly my, my honor and privilege, and I know folks that are here the same. Um, we'll close with this. I want to ask you a final question. Um, what are you still excited to accomplish in your career? What would you still like to do? I mean, you've done so much. Well, um, I would like uh, for this place to continue so our community will still have these jobs and uh, their families still have a place to work. You know, we have uh, employees that have been with us for over 40 years where they started when they were kids and their kids have started working for us and now we have some of their grandkids that have started working for us and I would like to be able to continue to provide these jobs for our people in our community. That's important to you, isn't it? It is important. Starkville, for folks who haven't been here, is not a really huge city. It's not a giant city. It's a small town. Mm -hmm. And you've employed now the third generations. You're, you know, yeah. that's pretty special, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Wow. We're uh, in about a, a year and a half. We'll be 50 years. <laughs> wow. Wow. Mr. Jew, I, I've had the blessing of... of, of Speaking to many people live, this is the most honorable thing I've ever done. I want to thank you. I want to thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. All right. Folks, that was Martin F. Jew, the, the person who is in Mr. M. Mr. M. J. That's my wife, Karen. And my brother, Bob, is I'm behind me, I guess. There he is. Hi. Okay. That's the end of the show. We're doing social distancing. Make sure we have masks here in the building. Make sure we're doing the right thing to be proper. But the main thing is, is that he met with us. I'll never forget this show because, you know, that is the man who started the company. That's why it says MFJ on the box. It's his initials. And because he puts his initials on every product, he makes sure to take care of it when you buy it. That's why you have a worry-free guarantee. It's pretty special, isn't it? You can get a hold of MFJ by going online, mfjenterprises.com. You'll find them mfjenterprises.com. Search on whatever search engine you'd like to look at. Take a look at their vast array of products from antenna tuners to amplifiers, noise cancellations to chokes. They've got an amazing array of products that will truly help your ham radio. Thanks for watching Ham Radio Live. We'll be back. We have the honor and privilege of being able to actually work K5MFJ, and I am beyond thrilled to do that. But this was, if I can be honest with you, this was what I was most excited to do. I was excited to spend time with Mr. Jew. So thank you so much from both of us here at MFJ. We'd like to have a very much wish you a pleasant day. May God bless you and have a wonderful, wonderful Wednesday. We'll catch up with you next from K5MFJ. Until then, goodbye, everybody.